So that's why I really wanted to uh, bring this subject up tonight. It's it's a little maybe boring for some people and it's a bit wordy, but I think we do need to go through this as a church so we have a good understanding. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us tonight. Father, I want to thank you, Lord God, for the privilege of being here tonight. I thank you for your loving kindness and your grace and your mercy. You are so worthy to be praised, my God. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Saviour, mighty God, there is none like you. I just pray, Lord, you'd move by the power of your Holy Spirit tonight, my God. Speak to us, my God, lead us and guide us, my God, I pray, Father. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Um, I'm going to be referring to lots of scriptures, so I'm, I'm making a, a recording as well, so I'll put it on the WhatsApp later on, and so you can find the scriptures if you can't find them tonight. So I'm going to preach tonight about, not just about speaking in tongues, about the, the arguments against it, why people say wrong things, and that's why I want to pick up for and it's best to understand why they think them things and what is the truth of the Bible. Um, so first I'm going to go back to Acts 2.38. Go back to Acts 2.38. And the first um, argument that speaking in tongues is not for today. You get some Christians, most of them from what are called Reformed Christians, and they believe that, you know, that speaking tongues is not for today. And they cite two verses. Um, well, they cite one verse, really. I mean, the other one's not a, a verse. Mm. Trying to back themselves up to say that it doesn't apply to the church today. Acts 2.38 says this. And this was on the day of Pentecost. Um, when the church started. The day the church started. Um Repent, Peter said to them, and be baptised each one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Now what had happened just there on the day of Pentecost is when the church gathered together, the Holy Spirit came on and they all spoke in tongues and prophesied. And the people said, oh, look, they're drunk. They, you know, they're speaking in foreign languages. And it says, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. Why is this happening? And he said, they're not drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. As you, you know. But what you're seeing is the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what they saw was them speaking in tongues. They'd receive the power from God, which is the gift of the Holy Spirit, to be a witness. The sign that they received it was speaking in tongues. And they said, that promise is for you, for your children, and all whom the Lord our God will call, that means down eternity. So whoever gets saved in the future from 2,000 years ago, right on today, means that they, that gift is for them today exactly as it was Amen. today, as it was 2,000 years ago. Um, now the verse that a lot of people will use is in Acts, is 1 Corinthians 13, 8. And this is the uh, verse that people will say, oh, there's no more speaking in tongues anymore. Um, and this is the verse that they, they quote. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. And as for languages or tongues, they will cease. So there is a time that it says that it ceases, that speaking tongues does stop. If you stop at that line and don't continue. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfect comes... The partial will come to an end. So what they say is, what people argue against speaking in tongues is, when the Bible come together, that which was, and they say that's that which is perfect. It's nothing to do with the Bible. They say, that which was imperfect becomes perfect. That means when the Bible was put together, we don't no longer need speaking in tongues. Now if that was true, also we wouldn't have no knowledge, because knowledge would cease. Because if you look again, it says, Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for languages or tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. So... If that means there would be no knowledge if the tongues had ceased and the prophecies ceased, then in the same sentence the knowledge would have ceased. But actually, if you look at it sensibly, without even looking deep into the Bible, just a plain reading of the Bible, that which is perfect, or that which is imperfect, becomes perfect. And that is me and you. One day when we are in heaven, we will leave this imperfect body and we will be perfect in heaven. We won't need prophecies 
our tongues or any human knowledge because we'll be in the presence of the Lord. And so that's the, the, the gate, that's the, um, the argument that he was against speaking in tongues when the Bible plainly says that it's a gift forever for the church. Um, and not only that, but it will never come to an end all the time that we're on the earth. The only time that we won't use, need speaking in tongues or prophecies or any human knowledge is when we're in the presence of the Lord. So that's the argument against speaking in tongues. Now, the sign constant, continually through the New Testament, the sign when somebody is filled with the Holy Spirit is that they speak in tongues. Now, I'm just going to quote some of these verses. You can find them there. Acts 2, 4. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different languages or different tongues as the Spirit gave them ability for speech. Acts 10. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also for they heard them speaking in other languages and declaring the greatness of God. How did they know they'd received the Holy Spirit? Because they heard them speaking in tongues and glorifying the Lord. That's in Acts 10. Now there's about a year between Acts 2 and Acts 10. So in the beginning it was like that, 10 years later. Acts 19 up to 30 years later. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began to speak in other languages and other tongues and prophesy. So all the way through the New Testament, every time somebody was baptised in the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues or spoke in tongues and prophesied. The only one time that anybody was filled with the Holy Spirit, it says they saw that they, was, that they were filled with the Spirit. So they actually saw an outward manifestation. It could have been anything, but they actually saw something. So four times in the New Testament where people are filled with the Holy Spirit, and then three times they spoke in tongues. The other times the Bible says that the people saw them doing something. So they saw the effect of the Holy Spirit upon their lives. Now, <coughs> I'm just drink. now, the different kinds of speaking in tongues, the one on the day of Pentecost that I read in Acts 2, it says that they heard him speaking in languages that they understood. Those Parthian Medes and those from um, different countries all around the world. So it can be a language that's an understood language, for sure. When you speak in tongues, it can be a... Now, that is not often. I've heard testimonies. We don't go by testimonies. We go by the Word of God. We know it happened in Acts 2. But in other times after that, the Bible says this. Acts 2, 6. When the sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Mm. So there was many, it was eight languages that's lifted that day. But it also, it says in Corinthians, if I speak in human or angelic tongues, if I speak in humans, that's what, so human languages is language that we can understand, or angelic tongues, maybe it's the language that angels speak, but either way, it's not a human language, it's an angelic language. And he's on about, in the context, he's on about having love, which is where love never fails, where the prophecies will cease and the tongues will cease. So it's all about the context about speaking in tongues. And 1 Corinthians 14, 2, this is a different use of, of speaking in tongues. For the person who speaks in another tongue is not speaking to men, but to God, since no one understands him. So they're speaking in tongues that there's not a language that nobody can understand them. Now, if you really want to know in the Greek where the word speaking in tongues comes from, it's very difficult. But if you backtrack the Greek word back, it means the sound that comes from behind your tooth. So, you know, when we speak words, we come, the sound that comes from behind our teeth is speech. Now, it can be a human language or it can be a, just a noise that we don't understand. It doesn't have to be what we think like a human, you know, it has to sound like Greek or Hebrew. But it's words that come from behind the, the lips or behind the teeth. In 1 Corinthians 12, it says this. Now, there are different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. And there are different activities. The same God activates each gift in each person. A demonstration or manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person to produce what is beneficial. So, the gifts, we don't only have them, but we actually manifest them. We show them. They're an outward sign to everybody else. Now, that's an important part. We're going to look at what an outward sign is because, you know, you, people say, oh, yeah, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, how do you know that you're filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, first of all, you'll have, a, you'll have a, the power from God to be a witness. That's why the Holy Spirit was given in the beginning. Yeah. But also the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking about 
having a fire in our lives to burn up the rubbish in our lives. So there's something of the Holy Spirit that burns up the rubbish to make us holy people. And there's a... I'm, I, I'm, I don't want to go ahead of myself, so there's a showing of itself. Now in the Bible, it says, speaking in tongues is for you, speaking in tongues is for the church, and speaking in tongues is also for the unbeliever. Now how can it be for you? Well, the Bible says, and I want to get to that in a minute, that when you speak in tongues, you edify or strengthen yourself. Paul said, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. Because when you speak in tongues, so when you get alone in your prayer time and you're talking tongues to God, you're strengthening yourself. It's your prayer language. When your spirit prays directly to God, it's, it's, it's strengthening you. Now, in the Bible, when speaking in tongues is also linked with prophecy. It, it, it actually says when you speak in tongues and someone interprets it, it equals it with prophecy. It's the same as prophecy. So speaking in tongues with interpretation, that means somebody stands up in the church, speaks in tongues. Somebody stands up and gives the interpretation. That's for the whole church. It links it the same as prophecy. So speaking in tongues is for yourself, but it's also for the church. But it's also for the unbeliever, believe it or not. And not a lot of people understand this. 1 Corinthians 14:22. It follows that speaking in other tongues is intended as a sign, not for believers. So we don't need a believer. Believers don't need a sign. We have the hymn filling. But for unbelievers, Mark 16, and this is where you'll, you'll pick it up now. You know the great verse that Mark 16, go out in the world and preach the good news. This is what it says. He said to him, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the old creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, and whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons, and they will speak in new tongues. This is a sign of true believers. Amen. He said that the believers will see, the true believers will, they will preach the gospel, speak in other tongues, and miracles will happen. So it's a sign to the unbeliever. And so if an unbeliever is interested in the things of God and they see what a true Christian is, a true Christian is one that is speaking in tongues or will speak in tongues, or, or at least agree with because we all have the opportunity to speak in tongues because it's a promise for everybody, the Bible says, all of the Lord our God will cause. It's not just for some, it's for everyone. So if you are not filled with the Holy Spirit yet, speak in tongues, you can be. And how can I confidently say that? It's because God has promised it and he's not going to promise you something he's not going to deliver on. Now, there's time sometimes, sometimes it's instantly. I know I remember Ada, when I want to be with Lord and Eddie's Ada, she got baptised in the Holy Spirit when she was baptised in water at the same time. She came out speaking in tongues in the, in the, in the, in the, in the tank. Um, and many other times like that. Uh, maybe myself, I was baptised in the Holy Spirit before I was baptised in water. But we don't go by our testimony, we go by what the Word of God says, and that's the most important one. When speaking in tongues in a church, now in a church, in a church setting, now in Corinthians this part is about how, how, do you, how do you have church. It's about breaking of bread and, and uh, preaching and different things. So in a church setting, it says, Therefore a person who speaks in a tongue should pray that he can interpret. So you might see somebody stand up and speak in tongues in a church situation, not just by themselves where they're praying to strengthen themselves, Obviously not as a sign to the unsaved because that's when they're out, you're out on a mission and people say, look what a true Christian is. But if you're in a church and somebody stands up with the anointing to be able to speak in tongues, the Bible says that that should be interpreted. And if it isn't interpreted, the person who even said the tongue, they should pray that God gives them the interpretation because it's not for me, it's for the church. Once a tongues is interpreted, it becomes prophecy for the church that means everybody can be uplifted if i'm only speaking in tongues myself it's only me that's getting strengthened but if i speak in tongues and it's interpreted it's for the whole church and the bible says prophecy is for edification for building up the church and so that's so so important because in 1 corinthians 14 4 it says the person who speaks in other tongues builds himself up but he who prophesies builds up the church so when you speak in tongues and it's interpreted it's prophecy. He said, you know, prophecy is greater than speaking in names unless it's interpreted. So when it's interpreted, it's the same as prophecy. It's for the church. Now, it also can be other things. And this is why you get confusion about speaking in tongues. In 1 Corinthians 14, 14, it says this. For if I pray in another tongue, my spirit prays. But my understanding is unfruitful. That means I don't know what I'm praying. I don't know the words. What then? I will pray with the Spirit, 
And I will also pray with understanding. That means I'll pray in, in tongues and I'll pray with understanding like we do in a prayer meeting. I will sing with the Spirit or I'll sing in the Spirit. So there's a place in church where somebody can actually sing in tongues. Now, if you're going to start that, please make sure you're a good singer before you start. There's nothing worse than a horrible singer. Because, and it goes on to explain itself here. And I will also sing with, so I'll sing in the Spirit and I'll also sing with my understanding. That's singing songs of worship to God. Otherwise, if you praise with the Spirit, how will the uninformed person say, Amen? So they're speaking in tongues to be interpreted. But if you're speaking in tongues for yourself, you don't need to stand up and shout it out and scream it out. You can sit by yourself. Now, I haven't got a problem if, any, if there's a few people praying and speaking in tongues, that's great. But if there's an anointing where it needs to be interpreted, we need to be quiet and hear the interpretation. The Bible, doesn't, the Bible says, do not forbid speaking in tongues. That's very important. Verse. Do not forbid speaking in tongues. Now, and, and there's a plain verse for the people who's trying to say it's finished now. It's not, the Bible says, do not forbid speaking in tongues. Um, praying in the Spirit, in 1414, if I pray in another tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. So, the, what we've looked at already in speaking in tongues is the initial evidence, that means the first thing that happens when you're baptised in the Holy Spirit. It means the initial evidence. There was a manifestation. The Bible says that you're going to receive the Spirit. But there's also there's a showing there's a manifestation of that. The manifestation is speaking in tongues. So speaking in tongues is not, listen carefully, the power from God. It's only the sign that you've received the power from God. It's the initial evidence. The initial showing. <laughs> that, so you receive the power from God to be a witness but you will speak in tongues because that's the initial, the first sign you'll receive for that. Um, I don't want to try and go over it too many because it's a lot of stuff here. And um, I'll read from 1 Corinthians 14. I'll read just from the end. If any person speaks in another tongue, there should be only two or more three in each in turn and someone must interpret so that seems to be a contradiction but if everybody's speaking in tongues to the lord no problem you can get 10 20 50 if you like but if somebody speaks in tongues to be interpreted for the church it should be only one two or three messages maximum and they should wait for an interpretation so if somebody goes stands up you'll see is when we know church when we when we practice this um somebody will speak in tongues and we'll wait for the word of you know wisdom or knowledge or the understanding of that prophecy we'll wait and see a word from god a prophecy for the church or it can be a word of wisdom a word of knowledge for the church it's an interpretation of that speaking in tongues for the church um but if there's no interpreter then the person should keep standing in church and speak to himself and to god that means if you stand up and you give a message in tongues and there's no interpretation continue to pray but be to praying to god to edify yourself or to worship him not to bless the church so the reasons to speaking in tongues is to be interpreted to bless the church as an initial evidence that you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, as a sign to the unsaved that they see what a true Christian is, and as a, as a prayer language for yourself to strengthen yourself. So there's many uses for speaking in tongues. It can be an angelic language, it can be a human language, it can be a language that we don't understand, it can be a past language, maybe a language that's not even... I think there's only about 10% of languages left in the world that was stuck, that's been over time. Most of the languages have been forgotten. And they've lost them. Like someone like we've lost Romulus. The same kind of way. I mean the language goes with each generation. Um, let's go back over that. I just want to read uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 8. Verse 31. And this is going back to the gifts. And we'll be looking at the rest of the gifts next week and the week after. Or, or sometime before the end of the month. So one is given a message of wisdom through the Spirit, or another a message of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, to another performing of miracles, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between Spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. So two of the gifts that's used for the benefit of the church is speaking in tongues and interpretation. So when they're put together, they're equal for prophecy. Prophecy means 
been speaking forth the things of God. Remember this, prophecy is only for edification, for building up of the church. I've shared this testimony before, but I think I'll, I'll use it to explain how it can be misinterpreted. We was in a church in uh, Blockswich many, many years ago. And these people come in and they said, they started prophesying and speaking in tongues, interpreting. God has said that God is going to bring this church down. He's going to crash it down and, and everything's going to go wrong. And me and David, God, it wasn't our church. It was before we had an Egyptian church. It was a gorgeous church. And we said, stop. We know that's not from God because what you're prophesying isn't edifying the church. And that's how you can judge prophecy. The Bible says we should judge them things. If you know it's edification of the church, then crack on. But if it's to drag people down, then you know it's not from the Lord. That's what prophecy does. So tongues with interpretation is prophecy for the church. Um, at the end of that verse, and this is another one of the verses where people say, ah, not everybody should speak in tongues. But listen carefully. Verse 28. And God has placed these in the church, first apostles, Second prophets, third teachers, next miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, managing various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Obviously not. Do all do miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in other languages? Now if I stop there in mid-sentence, it means it's a rhetorical question. Does, does everybody speak in tongues? Read the next half of the verse. Do all interpret? Yes, everybody can speak in tongues to be interpreted. Yes, do all speak in tongues with interpretation? Absolutely. Why? Because it's a promise from God. This promise is for you, all who are far off, all whom the Lord our God will call. Now in the Bible, we have um, what they call a pattern. You pick up what the early church did. We have our church meetings, but we pick up from the Bible. We see how the early Christians met, how they come together and worshipped, how they come together on the first day of the week, Oh, they broke bread. Now, sometimes there's not a command for us to do that, but we just copy what the early church did. And all the way through the book of Acts for 30 years, every time somebody got baptized in the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues. It's a biblical pattern. That's how we pick up understanding that what is wrong and what is right in the Bible. Now, um, someone to counteract my argument because of this. Some people think because they speak in tongues, they may be a better Christian than somebody else. Well, let me just tell you, remember, it's for everyone. And if you're not yet baptised in those people speaking in tongues, then seek the Lord and he will fill you, without a doubt. Because the Bible says, if I speak in human or angelic tongues, but I've not love, I'm only a clanging gong or a clanging cymbal. I'm like an empty bell. You see, speaking in tongues, being baptised in the Holy Spirit, not only gives us a, a power to reach the lost, it gives us a love for the lost. And if we haven't got that love, then the speaking in tongues is just an empty noise. It's, it means nothing. So you can have somebody that's speaking in tongues, you can have come to somebody going, you can sing in tongues, oh, they can sound like an angel, but they can act like a devil. Mm -hmm. And so speaking in tongues is not going to make you more holy. The only way it can make you holy is when you're by yourself and you're praying and you're edifying. It means to strengthen yourself. You're in weakness. You you don't want to pray. You've got problems in the family. You go to the Lord in prayer. You don't even know what to say. The book of Romans says we utter mysteries with our spirit that no one can understand. Groaning in the spirit. So we speak to God when we really need, when we haven't got the human words anymore. And he edifies, he strengthens us. But to make us holy is the power of the Holy Spirit as he comes with his winnowing fork and fire to, to burn the rubbish out of our life. And to live a life worthy of the call of God. That's what the Holy Spirit does in our life. A sign that the Holy Spirit is working in our life. Or that we have the Holy Spirit. Is that we speak in other tongues. Um, should we pursue it? Bible says in verse 1 of that chapter. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. And above all, that you may prophesy. For the person who speaks in another language, another tongue is not speaking to men, but to God. Since no one understands him, however, he speaks mysteries in the spirit. But the person who prophesies speaks to people for their edification, encouragement and consolation. Mm -hmm. The person who speaks in another tongue builds himself up. But he who prophesies builds up the church. 
I wish all of you spoke in other tongues, but even more that you prophesied. The person who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so the church may be built up. And so speaking in tongues just for yourself is all great, great for you. But speaking in tongues with, with interpretations for the whole church to edify, to lift up the church of God. And that's the most important thing. Um, go, I'll go on from there to verse 6. The Bible pretty much explains itself. But now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in other tongues, how will I benefit you unless I speak with you with a revelation or knowledge of prophecy or teaching? So when I speak in tongues or when you speak in tongues, that that interpretation is either a revelation or um, uh, something that will benefit, you know, a benefit of the church, a knowledge of prophecy or a teaching. Um, there are doubtless many different kinds of tongues in the world and all other meaning. Therefore, I do not know the meaning of the language. I will be a foreigner to the speaker and the speaker will be a foreigner to me. So if somebody gets up and speaks in tongues of the church, it should be with interpretation so the church can understand it. Otherwise, what's the point? You're only benefiting yourself. And the Bible says the reason that we come together is to help one another. You know what church, you know what church is? Church is the, the gathering of the, it's the ones that's called out together to come. The Bible says when you come together, each one should have a word or an edification or something to build each other up. Amen. Not coming to backbite or call, but come to edify one another when we speak in tongues to interpret the church it's for edification of the church but it's important because paul said these words i thank god i speak in tongues more than all of you why would he say something like that because he knows he needs the strength of god and how much more do me and you need the strength of god today thank you lord how much more do we need that power from god how much more do we need god to speak to us in our meetings how much more do we need the revelation of God for somebody to go up and speak in tongues, somebody interpret it, and then God to speak to the church. And the Bible says that they could fall down and know that God is here by their prophecy. It's so important that we don't go today. And the reason I start this is because the Bible says there will be free, false teachers among you. Will be. There was false prophets, but there will be false teachers among you. And this is one of the things that's been attacked by the, by the, in the, by the general church today. You know, they're looking for other things. Stick to the Bible, what the Bible says, and you won't go wrong. Amen. Let's just do it as the Bible says. Let's do it as the early Christians practice it. And let's continue in the faith. I'll read from verse 26. What then is the conclusion, brothers? Whenever you come together, each one has a psalm, a teaching, a revelation, another tongue or an interpretation. All things must be done for edification, the lifting up. This is when you come together. So coming together, somebody stands up and prophesies. Um, somebody stands up, sorry, and speaks in tongues. And it's interpreted It's for edification for the church. If any person speaks in another tongue, there should be only one or two at the most three, each in turn, and someone must interpret. So the ones that's interpreted, the ones that people stand up and speak in tongues for the church, it must be interpreted. If not, the Bible says, um, if there's no interpreter, that person should keep silent and should speak to himself and to God. Two or three prophets should speak and the other should evaluate. If something has been revealed to another person sitting there, the first prophet should be silent. For all can prophesy one by one so everyone may learn and everyone may be encouraged. It says there that each one should evaluate and others should evaluate. I don't know if you know, but sometimes in our church, if somebody's got a word from God, a word of knowledge, you'll see them come forward to one of the preachers and they'll share it with that person. And that, that they will judge, that elder will judge whether it's right for the church or wrong. Yeah. And that's why we should evaluate prophecies. You should, if you know, somebody has a word of knowledge or a word of, they believe is for the church, they don't just stand up and just give it, you know, from the pulpit. If it's an important thing, they come to one of the elders and the elders will say, yeah, well, that's biblical or, you know, maybe that's not the right time or whatever it might be. They will evaluate, they will judge that. It's your your responsibility to give it to the elder it's their responsibility to evaluate whether it's right for the church at that time and it goes on to say this and this is important and the prophet's spirits are under the control of the prophet <coughs> since god is a god of not a god of disorder but of peace the prophet's spirit is subject to the prophet what does that mean that means this when you get filled with the holy spirit 
and God gives you another language. He doesn't come along and hit you in the back of the neck and make you speak. He doesn't take over your body in any way. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. That means you can speak in tongues when you want to and you can stop when you want to. It's not uncontrollable. That would be a mess in the church. God gives the language. By faith we must speak it out. God will give you a word. It might even sound like a noise, but it will give you a word. You can speak it out. That's from the Lord. Amen. That's the important part because he's not going to come down. I know many people don't get baptized in the Holy Spirit for many, many years because they think that God is going to come down and just shock the way through their body and speak through them. No. God gives the language and we speak it out by faith. All the gifts the Bible says are by faith. So if even like in all the gifts, we'll be looking at the next week. You know, if there's a gift of um, miracles, I always say, a gift of healing for someone. Now, if somebody has a gift of healing, it doesn't mean they have a ministry of healing. And we'll be looking at that next week. It means that God has given them a gift for somebody else that they be healed, the other person be healed. But you have to step out in that. You know, if you said, oh, God's told me, Jim, he is going to be healed if we pray for him. They come to the elder to tell us, if we believe it's from the Lord, we'll go and pray with that person and they'll be healed. That's a word from God. And that's how we need to understand that the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophet. God is not going to overtake your body. He's not going to fill you so much that you have no control. No. That would be a disaster in church. And that would, that's why Paul wrote this letter. That there wouldn't be a disaster in church. Because he wrote this to Corinthians because they were doing it all wrong. And these were the teachings to make it right. These are a list of the things that he made. This is the mistakes and this is what you should do. Same today. We make mistakes, what do we do? We go back to the Bible and learn what to do. So first and foremost, we're going to finish there. Speaking in tongues on the day of Pentecost was a sign of the church. It's actually an opposite to Babel. You know the Tower of Babel? When the Tower of Babel was upon the earth, the Bible says God confused them and gave them different languages. What happened on the day of Pentecost, because the Tower of Babel was the separation of God from man, it was a terrible time. On the day of Pentecost, when God brought the church together, people understood the languages. Before the languages were baffled, now they understood the languages. It was a coming together, it was a fulfilment of prophecy. Speaking in tongues is an initial sign of baptism in the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues is a sign to the unsaved that they know who a true Christian is, according to the Bible. Speaking in tongues is for edification of yourself, and speaking in tongues is for edification with interpretation for the church. The Bible says this, be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. That means you be filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. How do we, the Bible says, how do we ask? How do we get, how do we receive the Holy Spirit? And this is his words. The Bible says this. Would, would you, if you ask for a fish, would God give you a stone? No. How much more will you receive the Holy Spirit when? When you ask. How do we receive the Holy Spirit? We ask God and he will fill. Let's pray and ask the Lord tonight to help us.